Today we're going to be learning about electromagnetic waves and the electromagnetic spectrum in general. This will be a bit of a change from sound waves because electromagnetic waves are different in quite a few different aspects. So to start with, we'll be talking about just electromagnetic waves, what they are, how they work, and how they differ from sound waves. To start off with, we need to know just a little bit about electric fields. Charged particles, like electrons or protons or that sort of thing, have little electric fields around them. Just like a magnet has a magnetic field around it that lets it do things like pick up paper clips. We can see this in, for example, static electricity. If you rub a plastic rod against your hair and then hold it near little pieces of tissue paper, the tissue papers will jump onto the rod. Now in 1831, this fellow here, Michael Faraday, figured out that electricity and magnetism are almost the same thing. So they're very, very closely related indeed. And this led him to develop a theory of electromagnetism. So what does this mean? We can figure out that a changing electric field will produce a changing magnetic field. So it means that if you run an electrical wire in just the right way, you can make it behave like a magnet. And the other thing is that a changing magnetic field will create an electric field. That means that by taking, for example, a permanent magnet and spinning it around or moving it quickly, you can create an electric current. And in fact, this is the basis of all electricity generation these days. But it turns out that a changing electric field will, that creates a changing magnetic field will also have that changing magnetic field create a new electric field. And that new electric field will create a new magnetic field and so on. This whole series of electric fields and magnetic fields will propagate outward very, very, very quickly in a wave. And this is what we call an electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic is such a long word that most of the time I'll abbreviate it on the slide here to EM. So surely if these electromagnetic waves exist, we'd be able to see them in nature. We'd be able to make an instrument that could detect those waves and say, oh look, there's one. Well, it turns out that we don't really need to do that because there's already a type of electromagnetic wave that we can see with our own eyes. And that is light. One of the amazing discoveries of the 19th century was that light was in fact a phenomenon of electric and magnetic fields uh, in the form of a wave that was propagating along very, very quickly indeed. But it turns out that light is not the only type of electromagnetic wave. Now, the electric and magnetic fields turn out to be perpendicular to each other and perpendicular to the motion of the wave's propagation. In this diagram, for example, the wave will propagate from left to right along this direction, or perhaps from right to left. The point is, the electric field varies in a direction that is perpendicular to the motion of the wave and not parallel, like a sound wave. As well as this, the wave does not rely on the collision of particles to propagate. We can create electric or magnetic fields even in empty space, where there's no atoms, no air, no, none of anything. That means that even if we don't have any particles at all, we can still get these electromagnetic waves traveling or propagating through empty space. So these properties make it a transverse wave because the electric field varies perpendicular to the wave's motion and not parallel. And it's a non-mechanical wave because it doesn't rely on particles to transmit it. Now it turns out that as I mentioned before, there's more than one different sort of electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic waves can take on a very wide range of frequencies. Remember that for a sound wave, different frequencies resulted in different pitches. The sound wave could be high or low. It turns out that if we change the frequency of an electromagnetic wave, then it will travel at the same speed through empty space as if we left its frequency the same. So all electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed through empty space. It turns out that if we put it through a medium like water or air, it'll tend to change its speed just slightly based on its frequency but it still moves far faster than a sound wave, for example. So the speed of light, or of any electromagnetic wave, is this number here, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now because this is in scientific notation, it's sort of a difficult number to visualize. So there are other ways that we can think of this number. We can say it's 300 million meters per second, or we could say it's 300,000 kilometers per second. When you think of how far one kilometer is or how far a thousand kilometers is, it makes you realize that light must be traveling very fast indeed if it can travel 300,000 kilometers in a single second. Where do electromagnetic waves come from? Well, obviously, if we make a light source, then we can produce them ourselves. But most of the electromagnetic waves on Earth originate from the sun. In fact, just about all of the energy that reaches us from the sun comes in the form of electromagnetic waves because these can travel through space 
even if there's no medium through which to propagate. As it turns out, even though light is traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second, that is three times 10 to the eight meters per second, it takes eight whole minutes for light to reach the earth from the sun, just because of the immense distances involved. So in fact, we're not seeing the sun exactly as it is at the present moment. We're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago, when it first emitted the light that we're now seeing. It means that when you look at anything really, you're not seeing it as it is in the present moment, but as it was just an instant in the past. And the further away we go, the further back into the past we're looking. And this brings me to the next slide, other stars and galaxies. Because of course, electromagnetic waves are able to propagate through empty space. If there's a star or a galaxy way out in the distance, way out in outer space, then light waves from those stars and galaxies will still be able to reach us. Although they have to travel very, very far and they'll end up getting very, very spread out by the time they reach us. Because of that, the stars aren't quite as bright as if they were as close as the sun. But if we look at any other method of transmission, you know, sound waves or mechanical waves, we can't actually receive any energy through those mechanisms from these stars or these galaxies. In fact, all of the information that we have about these celestial objects comes from electromagnetic waves that they emit. It's the only source of energy that we can pick up from them, simply because they're so far away and so far separated by emptiness. Because they're so far away, it takes a very, very long time for the light for even the closest star to us, aside from the sun, to reach us. It takes light from the sun eight minutes to reach the Earth, but the light from the next closest star, Proxima Centauri, takes over four years. And that's, bear in mind, the closest star other than our sun. So what if we go further back? What if we go to stars that are not closest to our sun? It turns out that if we look at the very most distant galaxies, we don't see anything because it would take longer than the age of the universe for light from those galaxies to reach us. So what this means, we don't see any light from the most distant galaxies, probably there, but we'll never be able to see them simply because the light from those galaxies has not had time to reach us. In addition to that, there's also the expanding of the universe and the sheer distances involved, which makes them extremely faint and extremely hard to see anyway. So that's the end of the theory. We'll learn a bit about what electromagnetic waves are and a little bit about how they work. So let's go on to some questions. Question one, what does the speed of an electromagnetic wave in a vacuum depend on? Does it depend on the wave's amplitude, its frequency, the speed of the source that's shining the light or shining the electromagnetic wave or none of the above? So let's go through the options. It's amplitude. Now, does the speed of a sound wave depend on its amplitude? Well, I'm afraid not. In general, in fact, the amplitude of a wave does not affect how fast it travels. If it did, then we might have, for example, louder sounds traveling more quickly than softer sounds, which we know isn't the case. In the same way, we cannot change the speed of light by making it brighter or less intense. B says it's frequency, but for the same reason as for sound waves, we know that this won't change light waves speed. So remember that the frequency of a sound wave determines its pitch, how high up it is. The frequency of light in fact determines its color, but we'll get to more on that later. The point is different colors of light and different pitches of sound all travel at the same speed through or usually about the same speed. So this won't affect the speed of light in a vacuum. How about C? This one looks likely the speed of its source. We know that if we have a moving object and it's say a car and from that car we throw a ball straight forward, that ball will end up moving faster than the car simply because we're adding the speed of the car to the speed of the ball. We've learned a bit about this in relative motion, but it turns out that we can't increase the speed of light simply by moving very fast when we first start shining that beam of light. So in fact, the speed of the source does not affect the speed of light. It means that if we have a very, very fast rocket ship moving at almost the speed of light and it shines a little beam of light straight forward, then from our point of view, this beam of light will only just be outrunning the rocket. And so no matter how fast the rocket goes, the beam of light from our perspective will always move at the same speed. If you're wondering what happens from the rocket's perspective, I'm afraid you'll have to wait for that answer. It turns out that if we're looking at things moving close to the speed of light like that, then very weird things begin happening involving time and space themselves changing due to these huge speeds. So if none of these are right, 
then the only answer left is D, none of the above. And it turns out that, of course, this is the correct answer. In a vacuum, beams of light, as well as all electromagnetic waves, always travel at precisely the same speed. And that happens to be 299,792,458 meters per second. Now you might at first assume that's an approximation, but in fact, this is an exact number. And it's how we define the length of a meter. If, for example, we discovered that the speed of light was a little bit faster or a little bit slower than we thought it was, then instead of changing this number, we would simply change how long a meter is. Question two. When we look at the night sky, what do we see? Do we see the stars as they are now, as they were in the past, as they will be in the future, or a combination of all three? Well, it turns out that, as we know, light doesn't travel instantly. It takes time for light to travel. Now, given how far away stars are, it'll take a very, very long time, years in fact, before any of the light from those stars will reach us. So in fact, when we look up into the sky, we're looking not at the star as it is now, but at the light of the star that it gave off, you know, four or five years ago. If we look at, for example, Proxima Centauri, the closest star to Earth, it will emit light at some point, but we won't see that light until 4.2 years later. The point is there's a four year lag between the star doing something and us seeing it. So in fact, when we see it, we're looking at what the star was in the past, and our answer is B. So using this technique to look up at the sky, we can never in fact see the stars as they are at their present moment. We have to infer that from what we know about stars. Question three, is it possible to generate electricity using a magnet? So I mentioned near the start of the slideshow a little bit about electromagnetism. Yes, it is possible. So we can use a magnet to generate electricity. So it turns out that electricity and magnetism are related so that a changing magnetic field or an alternating magnetic field that's alternately going north, south, north, south, as in a spinning magnet, will in fact create an electric current that goes positive, negative, positive, negative. So it means that instead of getting an electric current going around in one direction, we'll get it moving back and forth. And in fact, this is how generators produce electricity today. The mains power is alternating back and forth at 50 hertz because the magnet that produces the current is spinning at 50 times a second. Question four, is it possible to generate a magnetic field using electricity? And as I'm sure you've guessed, the answer is yes, it is possible. It turns out that a current that is moving in a circle, for example, loops of wire or a coil of wire that's been twisted around a piece of metal like a nail, then it will produce a magnetic field like a magnet. So what this means is that if we take a wire and we wrap it in very tight coils around, for example, a nail, and then turn the power on through that coil, that nail will turn into a magnet as long as we have the power on. As you might have recognized, this is an electromagnet. As it turns out, the more current we run through that wire, the stronger the magnet will be. So we can use loops of wire to create very strong magnets indeed. Question five, given that light moves at this speed, 300 million meters per second, and that it takes 8.26 minutes for light from the sun to reach earth, calculate the distance between the two. All we need to remember is distance equals speed times time. The problem is we're given a figure in meters per second and we're given a time in minutes. If we were to multiply this speed by this time, we wouldn't get an answer in meters because we don't have the same units of time. We're using seconds here and minutes there. And so we can't really mix these up. What we'll have to do is turn this number of minutes into a number of seconds, and then we'll be able to use it with our speed of light. The other thing that we could do, of course, is change this number into meters per minute. That wouldn't be using SI units, so we're not going to do it. The first thing we do is take the number of minutes and multiply by 60, and we'll end up with the number of seconds, which turns out to be almost 500 seconds. And what now? Well, of course, all we need to do is remember that distance is speed times time. So we've got time, we've got speed, and multiplying them together, we end up at an answer of 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters. So this is about 150 billion meters or 150 million kilometers. It's a very long distance. This is in fact roughly the value of the astronomical unit, which is a measure of distance often used in astronomy. So that's the end of the questions. In this section, we've covered electromagnetic waves and how they work. They're to do with the alternating electric and magnetic fields, of course. We've also looked at an example of an electric, electromagnetic wave, and that's light. In the next section, we'll be looking in more detail at different sorts of electromagnetic wave.